Good morning. It's about time for our services to begin. If you would, please open your psalm books to number 103. 254 254 Our song after the opening prayer will be number 300, number 300. Good morning, this is Ron Gilbert speaking for the Church of Christ. We welcome you to our worship service. We appreciate our radio and TV audience and invite you to worship with us. 
whenever possible. Our building is located at 4th and Magnolia in downtown South Pittsburgh. Our visitors are asked to fill out a visitor's card located on the back of the pew. Please drop this in the collection plate when it goes by and we'll have a record of your being here. We meet each Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. for worship. We have Bible classes for all ages following our morning worship service. We also meet uh, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. for Bible study. The purpose of the Church of Christ is to uphold the Bible as the Word of God and exalt Christ as the Son of God. We urge all to become Christians in the New Testament way. A, CV, a CD or DVD is to, of today's sermon is available free upon request or simply call uh, 837-6088. Others serving this morning, uh, Elijah Gilbert is directing our singing. The opening prayer will be led by David Francis. I'll be speaking at the proper time and then Sam Durham will have our closing prayer. Other announcements this month it has five Sundays in it, so we'll have a fifth Sunday dinner. And group one, we're in charge. So uh, be sure if you don't know your group number and you're in our group, I'll be sure to remind you. But uh, September the 6th, we have elders meeting at five. And also, that is the first day of the new quarter. And so all the promotions will take place that day. So uh, be sure and uh, be thinking about that. Also, you teachers, make sure you're in line for that. Notice we have several families out today. I know of at least four families who are gone, three of our younger families, and then uh, one of our elders, I believe they're making their yearly pilgrimage to the state of Texas. So I uh, keep all of those families in your prayers as they're moving around and so forth. Also, we're visiting with us today. We have the gases from uh, recently moved into the area. I uh, was talking to them, figured out that they're kin to me uh, through marriage, kin to my wife. Mary Catherine's uh, his aunt, I think, Stephanie. So if you're wondering who that is, you know you knew they was going to be here? Okay, I was going to say, well, you give me a heads up. But don't hold that against them. They look like a fine couple. So you go ahead and uh, feel free to talk to them afterwards, and we're glad that they're here. Good to see Helen Stewart back with us. She's been, uh, I think she said she's had about a, I can't remember how many weeks she said she'd been gone, but she had them counted up, and she said she's going to be whooping some folks when she came here today, and I was one of them. So y'all be looking out for a whooping, but we're glad to see her. Good that she's been able to get out and move around. Good to see Stephanie with her. John Haley, uh, Hallie is back home, but he will uh, have to go back to Nashville on Tuesday, uh, still going, trying to figure out what they can do to give him the greatest amount of relief. But he is having uh, some problems and was taken to Vanderbilt late last week, and uh, they uh, told him to come back on Tuesday. And he's, uh, Brenda was telling him he's up and moving around, but still uh, could be better. Josie Tolliver, her surgery was a success, a great success. If you saw her on Facebook today, she's moving around and good to uh, – to see her doing so well. I was texted this morning uh, and asked to put Earl Blevins and Brandon Rogers uh, on the prayer list. They were in a bad car wreck last night, and uh, it's good to see them. Good to see Gary and Jane Pelham here this morning. Boy, they just walked in. I just, uh, roof didn't even crack. Good to see you guys. We're so glad that you're here. We'll now have our opening prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege of coming before your great throne and expressing our feelings and our concerns for the world. Father, we surely you realize that there's so many desperate needs in the world today, all around us and throughout the world. We ask you to bless the effort of every believer throughout the mission fields and throughout our local congregations that we have as we try to strive to be a, a better influence and try to instill the truth into everyone surrounding us. Father, we ask you to look into the lives of all the sick here and amongst us as we have many older people in, the, in this brotherhood, and we, we know that many times sickness comes with age. Father, we ask you, to, your will be done, but if you can heal the people that are hurting spiritually and physically, we appreciate it ahead of time. Father, we thank you so much for every rich blessing we have on this earth. We ask you to look into the lives of uh, everyone here as we try to to be a, a better, live a better life, we ask you to bless us with the, give us the strength and courage to carry on throughout our lives. Uh, we ask you to be with this speaker, Ron, this morning as he delivers the message, and we ask you to be with everyone in the listening audience that they, they might reap a great benefit from the truths from your word, and as we carry on with the people around them. Father, as we continue to live our life and worship you, we ask you to give us uh, the knowledge to give us the strength, the interest that we need. Give us, keep us forgiven as we continue to, con to carry on your will and 
all things your will be done in Christ's name. Amen. Number 300. Our song of invitation is going to be number 270, 270. Good morning, brethren. Good to see everybody. Glad you're here. We're going to talk this morning a little bit about change of heart. Now, I was, had a song picked out to go with this. Of course, it would have had to have been on the screens, and uh, I knew if some of our younger families weren't going to be here, and so I thought not a whole lot of us might know it. But it's a beautiful song, talks about changing our heart, and talks, it's based off of Psalm 51, where, uh, you know, David asked for a change of heart, put in him a, a clean heart. And so as we think about a change of heart, let's imagine, if you will, two unhappy people. That's not really what I want to do with that, but I thought when I was making that up, that's what that looked like, two sad faces. But let's say we have two hearts. Now, I know these are not good-looking hearts, but uh, let's just imagine that these are two different hearts. One is the... Uh, non-converted heart, the other is the heart of a Christian, and we want to see how we can change our hearts and need to be in the process of changing our hearts, and that it's an ongoing activity when we talk about changing our hearts. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, the Bible says, cast away from you all your transgressions, get them away, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? You can hear Ezekiel pleading. Why don't you change the situation that you've caused? Here you're separated from God. You're not being what you ought to be. Creating yourself a new heart. Put away those transgressions. Repent, in other words. And they have the same language in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Of course, you're familiar with Matthew chapter 5, beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we see how important our hearts are. Now, when we're talking about our heart. We're not talking about our blood pump. We're talking about the, our intellect, our mind, uh, what makes us, our, our, the part of us that thinks. That's where we make in the decisions. That's who we are. It's in our mind. Who we are, how we act, all comes from this, this mind, this, this heart, as the Bible would refer to it. It's similar to the metaphor used for our overall feelings, our whole inner workings. When the Bible talks about bowels of mercy, it literally means intestines, but if what it meant was the, the part of man that hurts and breaks. You know when your heart's broken, how your head doesn't really hurt so much. Sometimes it does, but most of the times it feels like it's this deep uh, churning in your stomach, if you will. And so the, the, the ancients would say that was the bowels of your, your knowledge, you know, your entire being. And so that's simply all that's referred to with that. So the heart, we're not talking about the blood pump. We are talking about our intellect and our minds, which remind me of our 
our Sunday school, le our Wednesday night lesson this week. Appreciate the book that we're in with Brother John, uh, Aubrey uh, and the work, some of the metaphors, some of the things he's looked at, and I just could not help but think of the blind man in John chapter 9. If you remember, he was blind, and Jesus came and made a mixture of, of uh, spittle and dirt, mud, and put it on his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. This man hadn't seen. And when he went into the pool of Siloam and came out, he could see. He went from total darkness to being able to see everything that you and I can see, uh, from darkness to light. And what an illustration that is of our Christianity. When we decide, listen, I'm going to repent of my sins, I'm going to confess that Jesus is the Christ, and I'm going to be washed in baptism. The same idea, the same metaphor you can see from going from darkness, not being able to see, to being able to see. Great light. Our whole perspective should change. Now, we're going to be the same person that came up, that went into the water, is going to be the same person that came up. I know one of the things that was hard for me to understand was that God does the work in baptism. He cleans me up. But when I come up and I go talk to my friends, that same desire to use words I shouldn't use is still there. That same desire to do things I ought to not do was still there. And I was like, well, it must not have worked, you know, when I was younger. And, of course, that's not the idea at all. The idea is at that point in time, your sins were missed, but you've got to start adding those Christian graces. You've got to start showing those fruits of the Spirit. And that change is something that's going to take a while to be the kind of person that you ought to be. I dare say there's a whole, probably a whole room full of Christians here right now. And I think if I asked who has room for improvement, who needs to work on that, who could be better, we would probably all raise our hands, at least we were being honest. There's things I could still improve on. So you see, it's uh, not only a, a point of where one is, uh, uh, obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian, but there's this walk whereby I get better. And sometimes we have situations, we have times where we just don't get better for a while. We put it on the back burner or we just leave it. And we become unfaithful. God's not first in our lives. We even have trouble making it to services and stuff. We're just... We're not putting our hearts into it. And you see the same thing with football players, any kind of athletes. When they, the desire is not there, the fire is not there anymore, you can tell it in their performance. And a lot of times that's the same way with us. So this is a constant thing that we have to be working on. I certainly appreciate Brother Francis's prayer this morning. You know, life changes for us. Uh, the same things that were a great problem for us when we were younger, they don't bother us a whole lot now. You know, we've kind of matured past that age, but as we get older, well, we're given a whole another tool chest of stuff, if you will, that we're going to have to, to deal with. Uh, new tools and, and old tools that don't work anymore and things of that nature, we've got to, we've got to figure, and, and, and so the game changes, if you will. And so while I was having so many problems when I was younger with the youthful lusts and things of this nature, as I get older, I find it's hard to keep the same commitment that I had when I was younger and was fiery. Uh, I still have to keep working on that. And so because of the death and the burial, notice in John 9, verse 7, he went and washed in Siloam, and of course he came forth seeing. That's the idea. But because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that I can have my sins removed, that I'm no longer lost, I'm no longer, uh, I can have the gospel, I can be free from that, I can be the kind of person that God would have me to be. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is kind of like the 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 cornerstone of Christianity, if you will, of Paul's preaching. As we talked last week in judgment, if you find the apostles and so forth, they weren't very far removed at all from the cross of Jesus Christ in their preaching. Uh, sometimes they had to go to other places to begin their sermons and kind of get people to that point. You remember Paul in Acts chapter 17 dealing with a whole bunch of, uh, of course, pagans in Athens, didn't start talking about the God of heaven and his son and the prophecies of the Old Testament. These were pagans. They didn't believe the Bible no further than they could pick up Paul and throw him. They, they believed in Zeus and Mercury and all those guys, you know. So he started back with creation. It says there's some things that you can know from creation and works them to a point where he can talk about the resurrection of Christ and that God hath made that Jesus who one day is going to judge every man. And Acts 17, 30 and 31 and take them to there. Well, they didn't buy into that. A lot of them didn't, but some did. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul starts out that chapter talking about uh, the first four verses. Basically, he's going to tell you the thrust of his preaching. He said, I delivered unto you first 
that which I also received. Remember, he received it from the Lord, Galatians chapters 1 and 2. That which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Thanks be unto God that is the case. For uh, Forty-some days later, we find the first gospel sermon being preached in Acts chapter 2, and men being added to the church, the body of Christ. Christ gave himself that you and I could be free from sins, that we could be able to change our hearts, if you will, from being lost to being free, also from being ignorant. The change that takes place. Now, brethren, you have to admit, you know, when you're, when you're young, there's a lot of things you don't know. And I'm not saying ignorant to be un unloving or unkinder. I'm just talking about without knowledge. Just absent, don't know about certain things. You're ignorant of it. And notice the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, it, verse 5, says, O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be of an understanding heart. Luke 8, 11 talks about Jesus, has just uh, talked about the, uh, the uh, parable of the sower. He says, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. They were ignorant of it, they didn't understand, they didn't take it. But we can go from having that lack of understanding, being ignorant, to understanding. And as we mature in Christianity, we're going to find out a whole lot about things and, and of things that we should be doing and things that we shouldn't be doing as we grow and as we uh, walk this walk of life. In Matthew 13, same uh, parable that he'd been talking about in Luke chapter 8, the parable of the, the tear, excuse me, parable of the soils, his disciples came to him and asked him about that. Why did he speak and such? And notice what he says. For this people, the folks he'd been preaching to, heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. They, they've closed their eyes, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted. They should be able to grasp this. They should be able to know this. And notice how being able to see and to hear and to understand had a, had a change of their heart, should be converted, and he says, and I should heal them. Same context, verse 23. But he that receiveth, good, uh, receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, understandeth it, and beareth fruit. And brethren, that's where we want to be. We want to take and go away from having this lack of being ignorant to an understanding. Psalms 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. And as we read our Bibles and we study how we're supposed to live and, and grow and understand why it is that we're to do these various things, we become a people of understanding. And then we start trying to teach others. We also go from having unbelief. Notice Hebrews 3 at verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Notice, in departing from the living God. Now, what he's talking about in that passage is Old Testament Israel. He says, here you have the people of God. They didn't believe. They, uh, they didn't have any confidence in God whatsoever, and they were destroyed in the wilderness. And he says, take heed, brethren. He's talking to Christians there, that you don't have that same unbelief. Notice in Luke 24, verse 25, Jesus said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. They were preached over and over throughout the prophets of the Old Testament. The Messiah is coming. This is what it's going to be like and so forth. And yet when he stood in front of them, they couldn't see it. They didn't have the faith. They didn't believe. We can go from having unbelief and should from having unbelief in this dark heart to having faith. Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And remember, that's not talking about your blood pump. That's talking about your mind. Acts 8, 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart to the Ethiopian eunuch. And, of course, in verse 38, we have in 37, we have him making that great confession. And, of course, he obeys the gospel. In Acts 15, if you remember Acts 15 is what we call uh, when the church got together, the elders, the apostles came down to talk about. Because, you remember, you had some folks coming down from Judea teaching that unless you, uh, uh, you know, are circumcised, keep the law of Moses, You'd be lost, and Paul and them didn't put up with that, and that's what they're talking about. And notice it says, and put no difference between us and them. This is Peter talking, purifying their hearts by faith. They came to the understanding of who the Christ was. This is talking about the Gentiles, and they obeyed the gospel. And Peter says they were purifying their hearts through faith. Not only that, we go from evil thoughts. 
In Genesis chapter 6 at verse 5, we find one of the most disturbing passages in all Scripture. The thoughts, notice, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Men had become so wicked, their hearts had become so crusted over, had just become so hard that their conscience could not be seared, their hearts couldn't be seared. That's, the, that's what we find there. They're full of evil thoughts. Matthew 15, 9, Jesus says, but in vain. That's, in other words, worthless, emptiness. They do worship me, teaching for the doctrine, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. Here you've got people who are trying to be religious, if you will, and yet instead of doing book, chapter, and verse, doing what the Bible says, they've kind of come up with their own thing. And Jesus says that they are in vain doing this very thing. In Acts 8, verse 13, we find Simon the sorcerer. You remember he was part of the group there at, uh, in Samaria, and he obeyed the gospel. He said, man, I, I see those miracles. I've been doing magic. And I've been able to vex people, you know, uh, pull, the, pull the wool over their eyes, if you will, but they're doing something totally different. And so he obeys the gospel and sees that later on the apostles laying on the hand gave those. Remember, he wanted to buy that. And, of course, uh, he was told immediately, you've got to quit thinking like that. Repent of this thy wickedness and thoughts and intents of thy heart. You've got to stop thinking like that, thinking about how to make money all the time, best yourself, especially with these gifts. From God, you need to change your way of thinking. So go from evil thoughts to pure thoughts. And boy, that's just not an easy thing to do. You will not do it overnight. When I obeyed the gospel years ago, I was pretty much on fire for the Lord. Uh, over in Dade County, Georgia, the Hooker Church there, for about six months, I was absolutely on fire for God. But then something happened, and a uh, preacher there, uh, there was big problems in the church. Amazing how that happens, huh? And uh, kind of lost my zeal there for, for quite a while. And I understand how that kind of thing can happen. And if you're not working on cleaning out that mess you got in your head when you obey the gospel, you know, all those evil thoughts, all those things of the world that you're trying to fill up with new things. Remember what Jesus talked about the demon that was pushed out of the man. He was healed. The demon left the man. And, uh, but the man didn't do anything with the, he didn't fill that up, that void up. Said the demon went out, couldn't find anybody else, went back to that man, found it swept and gone, you know, his real cleaned out. And what did he do? He took seven of his companions with him. So he's even worse shape than he was before. So when round two, when I decided I was going to do what I ought to do, I realized that I was not going to be able to do as I had done before. I was going to have to fill up that void. I was going to have to quit listening to the music, hanging around the people and uh, doing the things that I had done before. I was going to fill that void up, and I decided to fill it up with good things, as we'll see here in just a moment, Philippians chapter 4. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's wisdom literature. That's saying, man, whatever, however you're ticking inside, that's who you are. It will come out. Maybe you're able to pull the wool over some folks' eyes for a time, but it'll come out. You get into a situation where you're tested, and the situation is rough, a lot of times that's going to come out. Notice also in Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. In other words, spend some time with it. For out of it are the issues of life. That's who you are. That's how you will behave. And that's how you're going to be. And then we think of Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. Anything that has virtue, anything has praise, think on these things. Fill your life up with good. And get the bad out of your life. It's difficult as a Christian. In fact, it's just about impossible to be a Christian and walk on the edge of, you know, brethren, we ought to flee. Just as Joseph, when the opportunity arose to, to do what was wrong, he didn't just say, well, I'm just going to hang out here and see how close to this edge I can get without falling over. He took off in the other direction. Brethren, that's a lesson for us. Get away from those things that cause us problems. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and every thought on the obedience of Christ. Get rid of the junk, keep the good stuff, keep the, the Christian thoughts, doing what we ought to be doing. So we go from evil thoughts to pure thoughts, also from unpenitent purposes. In other words, evil purposes. Romans 2, 5. Romans 2, 5. Romans chapter 2, begin verse 1 through about the middle of chapter 3, is Paul getting after the Jews. Now, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through the end of that chapter, I believe that's verse 32, he's getting after the Gentiles and talks about their homosexual tendencies and 
all the things that nature itself showed them was not right. He gets after them, but in chapter 2, he swaps over. He switches over and starts talking about the Jews, and notice what he says to them. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, they wouldn't do what's right. They weren't interested in doing what was right. They were uh, treasure stuff unto thyself, wrath against the day of the wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says society has a lot to do with that. And brethren, you know as well as I do that we live in a society that's pretty wicked. It's uh, trying to encourage us, trying to encourage our young people to do a lot of things that are simply wrong. And notice what the Bible says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. God's not going to stop. God's not going to reach down from heaven every time somebody wants to do something that's wrong, smack their hand, tell them no. He's put us in this area. He's put us in this world to see how we're going to react to that outside stuff. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had a country and a school system that wanted to help us as a Christian home raise our children up? You know, it used to, the schools, the government, and the Christian home were all on the same side. They were trying to make model citizens. Citizens. They were trying to talk, talk about the home, how we needed to be faithful to our mates and things of this nature. But that's changed, brethren and friends. Over the last 50 years, the home has become an enemy, I guess, if you will, to the state many times, as well as public schools. I'm thankful that we live in an area and, and, and in a country where we have public schools, and those public schools, for the most part, are allowed at the local level to determine the curriculum and so forth. But let's be uh, aware that that's changing all the time as more and more things come down from the powers that be. And so we even lose that because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. People see people sinning out there and they say, well, must be okay. Nothing's happened to them. No, not so. There will be a day of reckoning. Matthew 21, 29. And he answered and said, I will not. And after he went and repented. Now this is a go going from wicked to doing what's right. Notice from unpenitent purposes or evil to repentant or penitent purposes. And that's what we find happening with the young man. That's what we find happening in Luke 15. Daniel chapter 1 at verse 8. Notice Daniel purposed in his heart. Purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In Luke chapter 15, we don't have the time to turn there. But that's the story of what we would call the prodigal son. Three lost things, of course, in that chapter. The last one being the lost boy, if you will. Actually, you can say four if you talk about the lost older brother. But he wanted his portion, and he went away, and he lived it up. He just spent all his money, wasted all his money, got in some serious situation to a point where he was near death, just starving to death. He says, I'm going to go home. He, what, repented. That's the whole idea. He goes back home. Of course, his father runs and greets him and is so happy to see him. He's changed his thoughts. He's changed what he, he thought he wanted before. He got out there in it and found out it wasn't everything that it promised to be. We can go from hatred, having a heart of hatred. Notice with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. It's hard to imagine a being like Satan. It's hard to imagine somebody who hates so much that they would be willing to do so much to see that people would be lost. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, the opposite. Jesus says unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul. So the penitent heart, the Christian heart, is not one filled with hatred, but one filled with love, as we just saw in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. John 14, 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. You know what they used to say, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, there's the, that's the idea. How many people will say they love God, that they love the Christ, and yet they live their lives as though they don't even know God? I see so many things uh, on social media talking about, and, you know, a lot of folks are posting things that I, I, I'm thankful for. Uh, one of them, of course, is, uh, you know, people talking about, you know, a, a well doesn't give both, you know, sweet water and bitter water. Uh, how is it some people talk about how much they love God? How is it people talk about how much they love the Lord and want to do what God would have them to do, and yet in another post they'll get mad and cuss like a sailor? Uh, it's just it's not, it should not be so, and that's the idea here. Jesus says the true love is to keep my commandments. Notice we also we go from being rebellious and disobedient 
That is the unpenitent heart. That is the ignorant heart. That is the lost heart. In Jeremiah 5, verse 23, we find that Israel was a revolting and rebellious heart. These were the people of God. And yet they were constantly rising up against God. They were rebellious. That says they are revolted and gone. Chapter 6 is that great passage talking about seeking the old paths. He's trying to get them to turn, go and seek after the old ways. Notice what they say. They said, we will not walk therein. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that, they say. An open rebellion, shaking their fist in the face of God, if you will, and saying that's not how we're going to do it. We need to change that and be in an obedient heart. In Romans chapter 6, 17 and 18, that's exactly what we Paul, find Paul saying to the Romans. It says, but God be thanked that you were the servant of sin. But what happened? You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, being then made free from sin. The idea of leaving that rebellious heart and wanting to do what God says. Now, sometimes, brethren, that, that can be tough. That can be real hard. There's things, as, as a young Christian in particular, you're going to find you've been doing your whole life, and you think, whoa, wait a minute. That's, that's, that's in contrast with what God would want me to do. And so there's some things that might be easy. Usually for most of us, though, there's some things that are just, well, they're just difficult. They're hard to do. But we can be made free from sin. We can put those things away. We can be what God would have us to be. But don't always think it's going to be easy. Don't think for a moment there will be challenges all along the road. Acts 2.38, that's the mindset we see there. People said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Some of the people. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them to obey the gospel. Told them to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. We go from having a guilty conscience. I don't know, brethren, about you, but when I was younger, and I was doing things that I ought not to do most of the time, I knew very well that what I was doing was wrong. Now, sometimes I'd play games with myself. You ever do that? You ever deceive yourself? You ever play games with yourself? Going like, well, everybody else is doing it. Oh, well, you know, there'll be time later on. And I'm not so sure this is wrong anyway. And so you find yourself arguing with yourself, you know. Maybe it's about alcohol. Maybe it's about drugs, things of this nature. And then after one or two or whatever it is you're doing, uh, you find you no longer need to win that argument because you're not even worried about that argument anymore because you've inebriated yourself, and so you're not worried about that anymore. You ever do that? You ever have a guilty conscience? And, boy, thank the Lord for that guilty conscience. It's when your conscience quits pricking you. That's when you're in trouble. When your conscience is seared with a hot iron, as Paul would describe to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, having their conscience seared, they, their conscience wouldn't even be pricked anymore. That is a danger. That's always a danger, particularly if you're somebody who's not walking in the light as you ought to be. You're not being the kind of uh, Christian that you ought to be. Be thankful that you still have that conscience that can be pricked and allow that conscience to be pricked and, and, and cherish it and say, hey, you know what, this is bothering me. I, I want to fix this. We should be able to go from that guilty conscience. Notice 1 John 3.20. But if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. We can change that. John 8 at verse 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went one by one. Now, this is the woman that was taking adultery. Remember what Jesus told them? They said, the law says that she ought to be killed. What do you say? Of course, you know, there was another party missing there. There was no man. Obviously, she could not have been taken in the very act of adultery by herself. Remember, Jesus bent down, wrote on the ground, and then stood back up and said, he that is without sin, let him throw the first stone. Well, there's the result. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. Conscience is a great thing. Think about how much crime and immorality there would be in our nation if some folks, if folks, if did, people didn't have consciences at all. And that's one of the things that bothers me so much when you see habitual offenders. You find people who have been arrested 50, 60, 70 times doing that, which is wrong. You're like, these folks are beyond the conscience-searing thing. We need to do something because one day they're just going to kill somebody. You see, that's what takes place. That's what takes place. Don't allow your conscience to become seared. Conscience is a wonderful thing. The conscience tells us, even in a debate <clears throat> with the world's most renowned atheist at the time, his name was uh, Anthony Flew, he would not come across, he would not give up the fact that what the Nazis did to the Jews was wrong. 
Now, he tried every way in the world to argue around that and saying, well, just society as a whole dictated that was wrong. Of course, Brother Warren wouldn't let him buy with that. The Germans said that was the right thing to do. Their law said to do that. So they were tried, and when they were put to death, friends, when the Nazis that killed the Germans, or killed, excuse me, killed the uh, Jews, the ones that were at the high, you know, the hierarchy of that, were put to death, you know what law they were charged with? A higher law. God's law. You see, the Germans hadn't broke the law of England. Uh, you know, brother, uh, Mr. Flew tried to say they'd broken international law. They were not under international law. International law didn't touch that. What they had done was they had transgressed a higher law, that law of conscience, that law of God. It says everybody, even the Gentiles, knew. No. In Paul's day, Romans chapter 1, some folks know some things are just wrong. Uh, some things are just absolutely wrong, and the murder of innocence is about as wrong as you can get. It's called, they even call those war crimes. Imagine that, rules and war. But soldiers just aren't allowed to go into a town and start killing innocent civilians. Uh, that's understood in international law. That's understood in uh, American law. It's a uniform code of military justice. Our soldiers and sailors and airmen and are under. <clears throat> we don't do that. You can't do that. Thank goodness for the conscience. God gave us that conscience. You know, that's something that the evolutionists can't explain. There's a <laughs> they just about can't explain anything. But they certainly can't explain the conscience, the human soul, the human idea of right and wrong. You don't see that taking place in the animal kingdom. Uh, no, animals will do what their instincts say. They don't, uh, you know, you don't see them having any remorse uh, when they kill one another, things of that nature. Go from having a guilty conscience, notice, to being free from sin. Romans 16, 17, and 18, or oh, excuse me, Roman, uh, that should be Romans 6, 17, and 18. We've already read that. We won't read it again, but they had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. They were released from that sin. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Seeing you have purified in your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit of unfeigned love of the brethren. See what ought to be replacing the wickedness and things in our, in our hearts. We need to be able to turn those to do what's right, to fill it up with the love of God, love of brethren. And brethren, that takes work. It's not something you can just say, Well, I just that's going to happen. No, you have to work at it. That's something you have to work at. Some people have the misconception that once you're baptized, once you <coughs> obey the gospel, that you're just somehow going to be magically changed and transformed into somebody else. No. Granted, your name will be written in the book of life. <coughs> Granted, your sins will be washed away. But it's up to you to start changing that intellect, changing that heart, filling it up with good things, learning what God would have you to do, and putting away those bad things, the things that God would have you not to do. Put away the hatred of some folks to the love of the brethren, the love of God, and the love of men. 1 John 3, 21 says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And you can have an, a, a good, clean conscience. Boy, that's uh, so important. That, that goes so far. Look at what we've looked at. We can go from being lost to free, from being ignorant to having an understanding, from having unbelief, no belief, in the fact of having faith. We could go from evil thoughts to pure thoughts, from evil to good, from hatred to love, from rebellious and disobedient to obedient, from a guilty conscience to freedom from sin. It starts off with our obedience to the gospel, coming to the understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, being willing to uh, confess that before men, being baptized for the mission of our sins. But all the change we saw taking place in the heart, that's not some miraculous work of the Holy Spirit comes in and somehow flips a switch on you. Now that's when your mind and your intellect says, man, I have been guilty of this. I need to change. Here's what the Word of God says I need to be doing. I need to stop what I have been doing, do what God would have me to do. It is a process to grow and mature as a Christian. Let me encourage you here. If you're this, here this morning and you're not a child of God, you need to begin that walk. You need to begin that walk, and don't be disappointed. Don't be surprised if upon your obedience to the gospel that you find out you still have evil thoughts, that you still get into arguments with your siblings, that you still have problems with your parents or your children. Those things will continue, but we look at them differently now. 
We look at those troubles that we had before as opportunities for growth, as opportunities to be a better person and to help other people. It's the change of the heart. If you're here this morning, we can help you in any way. We encourage you to come as together we stand and sing. Are you ready to brother?